Welcome to worship as we gather in God's house. Some of us very eager to begin the service. Others of us may be tired but yet gathered in God's presence tonight. And we welcome all of you if you're a guest with us tonight. We pray that in this time of worship, we will be united by the Spirit of God into one body, one family, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And with that word of uh, welcome, let's open this service, quieting our hearts after today and after the week that's been. And let's ask for God's presence to surround us in this service. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, each of us comes to this place tonight with different needs. Some of us need a word of encouragement after a time of discouragement this week. Some of us need a word of challenge as we feel it complacent and lethargic in our faith. Some of us are looking at our lives and we feel a need for relationships, for friendships, possibly for a marriage, for healing. Father, each of us comes tonight with needs. And yet we confess that the root of all those needs is our need for you. And so we pray that tonight by your spirit you would be present in this place. Father, that tonight would be a night of encounter as you meet with us. And in your meeting as you heal and encourage and challenge and do all the things we need. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship? We proclaim the Lord's love this morning and His faithfulness now at night, and our call to worship is from Psalm 119, these words, May my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. May my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your promise. May my lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. The psalmist calling with our lips and our tongues to praise the Lord. Our opening songs help us do that. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, number 501, stanzas one through three and six, and then without announcement, Jesus, only Jesus. Free. He 
Friends, we've gathered today to bow before this Jesus and to walk with him. And this is the same Lord who comes to us with this word of greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be to each of you. From God the Father and Creator, from Jesus Christ the Redeemer, through the power and working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As God has gathered us in his presence and welcomed us, would you please turn and greet those around you in this name of Jesus. you may be seated. We'll be reflecting this evening on the life of Jesus, and we begin that in the Old Testament with one of the prophecies in Isaiah that points to Jesus the Messiah and his work. And so we hear Isaiah 35. Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring cactuses. Yes, There will be abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands. Encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for Your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool, and the springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the Highway of Holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will be only for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beasts. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. Let us respond to this great promise and song, asking that God would open our hearts to his life and truth. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 holy. to see you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. That is our prayer that we would see Jesus in the service and as we Prepare to go to God's Word to get a glimpse of our Savior. Invite the boys and girls up first for a children's message. So if you're a visitor here or a member, if you're a boy or girl, just come on up for our children's message tonight.
Well, good evening, boys and girls. It's nice to see you again. It's been a little while since you've been up here. Just have a question. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about Jesus and his power to heal. And as we reflect on that, I want to see how many of you have some sort of injury right now. Any of us have some injury? Yes, Ava, you've got a nice cast on. You, you fell this week, right? You broke your arm. So you've got an injury. Anyone else have an injury? We got another broken arm. Give me five. We're doing good. There we go. Yep. What do you have? Not, not sure? Do you have any injury? Does anyone like get any new teeth coming in? Maybe your mouth is sore. Is that a couple new teeth? Yeah. A lot of us have sometimes things wrong with our bodies, and we know that Jesus can heal. But tonight we're going to hear about a very interesting way that Jesus heals. And I just want to, to kind of show us um, one thing Jesus did once some person had something wrong with their body. They actually couldn't speak and they couldn't see. And what Jesus did is he spit, and then he touched his spit, and then he touched the part that needed healing. So would you mind if I rub this over your arm? Uh, maybe rather not. I'm guessing. How about you probably wouldn't mind, right? No, you don't want How about those just getting a new tooth? How about I put this in your mouth? Would you just open your mouth? No? You guys, well, we're going to hear Jesus actually spits and he puts his finger in someone's mouth and touches it. It's very interesting. We wonder, why did Jesus do that? Why does Jesus heal sometimes in these strange ways? And that's what we're going to reflect on today. And hopefully at the end of this sermon, you'll be able to tell your father and mother why Jesus healed that way. And as you do that, I invite you to, to listen, but first to get a piece of candy and go back to your seat. Thank you very much. And as they go back to their seats, don't worry. Okay. All better. I invite you to turn with me to the story of Jesus healing, and it's in the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to be Mark chapter 7 tonight. And Mark chapter 7, verses 31 um, to the end, to th- through 37. Also, we'll be reading our Will Belongs to God, paragraph 24 and 25. That is in our Grace Psalter hymnals, uh, and that is on page 1026, 1027. Um, and it won't be on the screen tonight, so I do invite you to turn to the Psalter hymn number page 1026 and 1027, if you can do that um, tonight. If you're a guest with us, we're moving through this contemporary testimony, Our Will Belongs to God, which moves through creation and to fall, redemption and consummation. We're in the redemption section. And we saw in this section three things so far. Well, actually, this is our third. We we first of all saw that after the wake of the fall, God doesn't walk away from us. He doesn't turn away from sin, but he turns towards us and begins the long road to redemption. That's what we saw in the very first sermon on redemption, that Jesus and God are bending this history in a road that brings us back to him. Last time then, we walked through the whole Old Testament, and we saw that the Old Testament is really a story of God bending stubborn wills back to himself. We saw in the prophets the call of God to bring the exiles home. And now in the story of redemption, we move to the New Testament and the person and work of Jesus Christ. And there actually are six paragraphs in the contemporary testimony dealing with Jesus. Tonight, we're going to take the first two of those paragraphs, and they focus on Jesus' birth, And then on his ministry, we're going to focus especially on that ministry part tonight. So as we do that, let's first read paragraph number uh, 24 and 25. Again, that's page 1026, 1027. I invite you to read these with me as a confession. Let's say together. God remembered his promise to reconcile the world to himself. He has come among us in Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh. He is the long-awaited Savior, fully human and fully divine, conceived by the Spirit of God and born of the Virgin Mary. In the events of his earthly life, his temptations and sufferings, his teaching and miracles, his battles with demons and talks with sinners, Jesus made present in deed and in word the coming rule of God. We're going to focus on that second paragraph tonight and that describes six things that Jesus did. His temptations, his sufferings, his teaching, his miracles, his battles with demons, and his talks with sinners. And we're going to look tonight at one of those six, his miracles. But these miracles with everything else we're told somehow makes present in word and deed the coming rule of God. And so we're going to hear a miracle story from Mark. And our question is, how does this display God's kingdom? 
As we ask that question, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. And Father, we thank you that because of your power at work in your word, it has the power to startle us even now, to stir within us a vision of your kingdom which can change our lives and through us be part of the renewal of your world. So Heavenly Father, do your work tonight. We plead and we trust in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 31. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought a man to him who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit, and he touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. The more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the dumb speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I think we all know the name Beethoven. We know that he was a German composer and pianist who was born around 1770, and he was a contemporary of Mozart. He studied under Joseph Haydn. Most of us know something about Beethoven. Others of us, at least if we know the name, we might even know a little bit of his accomplishments, that Beethoven wrote nine symphonies, that he wrote six concertos, that he wrote 32 piano uh, sonatas, that he wrote some 16 uh, string quartets, an accomplished and impactful musician. But maybe what less of us know is the suffering of this man. Beethoven, the great musician who gave the world such beautiful music, when he was around 28, began to go deaf. And that progressed throughout his life. By the end of his life, he was completely deaf. Many of his works that he's famous for, he never even heard. And for Beethoven, this was a time of great suffering. As a young man, we have a letter that he wrote to his two brothers. And in that letter, which he kept hidden in his personal papers and was found after his death, as a young man, he described the horror of living in a world that was closing in and growing silent. He wants us to hear some of his words. He said, For six years I have been a hopeless case, aggravated by senseless physicians, cheated year after year of the hope of improvement, finally compelled to face the prospect of a lasting malady. I was compelled early to isolate myself, to live in loneliness. When I at times tried to forget all this, oh, how harshly I was repulsed by the doubly sad experience of my bad hearing. And yet it was impossible for me to say to men, speak louder, shout, for I am deaf. What a humiliation. When one stood beside me and heard a flute in the distance and I heard nothing. Or someone heard the shepherd singing and again I heard nothing. Such incidents brought me to the verge of despair. But little more I would have put an end to my life. And so I endured this wretched existence, truly wretched. Again, a letter to his brothers. This captures the terrible difficulty of being deaf. When you're deaf, you cannot hear the world around you. But other people don't realize that, and so you have the stares of people who are trying to speak and are frustrated that you're not responding. And if you can't speak back, you are absolutely alone. You can't respond, nor can you hear. You are alone in a wretched existence That's the description of Beethoven for his life. And I hope that helps us understand a little bit the man that we've just read about in Mark chapter 7. And the question then is, this man and the suffering of deafness and muteness, if that is the case, what does the kingdom of God have to say to people like that? Or you could say, what is the miracle that takes away this suffering? What does that miracle show us about the kingdom of God? Because we're told that these miracles proclaim in word and deed the coming rule of God. What does it proclaim? And tonight I think that we're going to see three things that it proclaims. And these three things are things that maybe surprise us in this text. We're going to pay attention to the parts of the text that startle us because I think those are the parts that describe the kingdom of God. And and so we're going to look today at the where of the text. 
We're going to look at the how of the miracle, and we're going to look at the why of the miracle. And these things, the where of the miracle, the how, and the why, we're going to discover something about the kingdom of God. So first of all, the where. I'm guessing as I read this text, the first verse, verse 31, many of us didn't pay much attention to. We're told that Jesus uh, left the vicinity of Tyre. He went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Decapolis. Now, most of us, when we hear place names in Scripture, tend to let those things kind of float over our head. First of all, because we don't know those places, but second of all, because we already know Jesus. We know that Jesus is the seed of Abram, and so we expect that he's to be found in the promised land. We know that Jesus is the root and offspring of David. And so we would expect that he would be the good shepherd to the people of Israel. That we would expect to find him among the people of Israel in the land of Israel. So the place names really aren't that important. And we would expect this because we know Jesus and we know what he said. In Matthew chapter 10, he commends his disciples to go on a mission and notice what he says to them. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. That's what Jesus said his mission was and ours. And the one time he does leave the boundaries of Israel, there's a woman there who's pleading, will you do a miracle among us too? And Jesus responds, actually the, the chapter, the verse right before our text tonight, he says this to her, first let the children eat all they want. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And in the parallel in Matthew 15, he says to her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So place names aren't important. We know Jesus goes to the people of God and the land of God. But if we pay attention to where he actually is in this miracle, it might surprise us. Notice on the map, Jesus is not in Israel, which is the Sea of Galilee. Israel is this part down here. He goes up to Tyre, which is outside the promised land. And then when he goes back, he does this circuitous route up to Sidon and then back down to the Sea of Galilee. But then he doesn't go to Capernaum, his hometown, or Nazareth, where he was born. He goes to this part called the Decapolis, where the Gentiles live. In other words, you can see that Jesus here is going out of his way to get out of Israel proper. Jesus is showing us something about his ministry. And what I think he's showing us in this circuitous route, this surprising wear of the miracle, is that the kingdom of God is not as small as we like to think. It's not limited only to the good people of God or the safe places where God is worshipped. That the kingdom of God breaks through those barriers, that it transcends boundaries. You could say that the kingdom of God embraces the world. The wear of the kingdom teaches us this first truth, the wear of this miracle, that in going first to Tyre and then up to Sidon and then around to the Decapolis before he goes back to the Jews, is Jesus teaching in this miracle that the kingdom of God is big enough to embrace the world. That's the first thing we need to see about the kingdom shown in this miracle. But there's something else, and that's not the where, that's the how. So Jesus is in this Gentile region, and people bring to him a man, and they want him to heal, and they tell him how to do it. Notice verse 32. There are some people who brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. That's what they say, when you just put your hand on him and heal. But notice how Jesus actually does this miracle. It's different than what they're asking. And it's actually rather strange. First of all, he takes the man apart by himself, and then he takes his fingers and he puts them in the man's ears, the fingernails of God with human earwax under them, and then he spits, and then he puts that spit-filled finger in the man's tongue, and then he looks up to heaven and he sighs deeply, and then he says this strange word, and then there's a healing. And the question is, why does he do all of this? This how of the miracle, what's that showing us about the kingdom? And there's different possible answers. Some people say what he's doing here is this is actually medical. That in the ancient world, the way you would do a medical examination was with your hands. And so when he's putting fingers in the, in the ears and in the mouth, what he's really doing, he's just probing for information. It'd be kind of like if we would say, and so Jesus took out an oscilloscope and he looked in the ear and he took out a tongue depressor and he looked in the mouth and then he healed him. This is just a medical procedure, a medical examination. But I don't think that's what's going on because Jesus is the great physician, but he's not merely a physician. These gestures aren't medical examination techniques. Well, then another answer people gave was what he's doing here is a kind of a magic. That if you look in first century accounts of healers and there were other people who claimed to heal, 
they would often use certain special gestures to show that their healing was going to happen, and then they would say some magic incantations, some rare words, and that would enact the power. Maybe that's what Jesus is doing here. He's using weird gestures and weird words to kind of do some magic on this man. But that's not the case either. In the miracle right before this, when he heals this girl who's demon-possessed, he doesn't use any gestures. He doesn't say any words, and in fact, he heals from a distance. So these things that he's doing with this man are not things he's doing for his own sake. They're gestures he's doing for the man's sake. This isn't medicine. This isn't magic. This is something that's supposed to show meaning. And scholars say what's going on here is this man can't hear. And he can't speak. He has been all alone, a wretched existence, just like Beethoven. And so what Jesus is doing in the miracle is he is using sign language. He's saying, I'm going to heal your ears. I can't tell you that, so I'm going to touch them. And I'm going to heal your speech, and I can't tell you that, so I'm going to touch your tongue. And the way I'm going to do this is not through magic or medicine. I'm going to look up into heaven, and so you can see that I am praying. That Jesus here is communicating to the man in the only way that he can understand, through physical expressions, through sign language. And that shows us the second truth of the kingdom. The kingdom not only embraces the world, but now the kingdom of God also comes to us and meets us where we need it. That the kingdom of God meets us in our need. That the kingdom of God comes to us in ways that we can understand. And it still does today. We could say that's what the sacraments are. The sacraments are a holy sign language. They are God coming to us through water and through bread and through juice in ways that we deaf and dumb sinners can understand. Just like the spittle of the Savior, now the body and blood of the Savior reaching to us and saying to us, the kingdom of God is among you. Taste and see it, feel it, experience it. That's what the how of the miracle is pointing us to. But then finally, the the where of the miracle, the how, but now the why. What does that show us about the kingdom? Well, the miracles in the New Testament were told in John were meant to teach us to believe. That Jesus does miracles not for no reason, but they are to stir in us faith. That they are to be shared so that people can see what Jesus has done and know who Jesus is and put their faith in him. And yet notice something very strange in this miracle. Right after healing the man, notice what he says. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. Now that's strange for two reasons. First of all, it's strange because when Jesus was previously in the Decapolis, he heals a man who's demon-possessed. The man pleads, can I follow you? And for the only time in his ministry, Jesus tells someone, no, you can't follow me. You go back to your people in the Decapolis and you tell them what God has done. Now Jesus is back in the Decapolis, and yet he's done another miracle. And notice he says, don't go tell. He says, don't tell. And that's doubly strange because what he's just done is open someone's mouth. So he's just done a miracle so someone can finally speak, and the first command he gives them is don't say anything. Does that strike you as odd? What is this doing? What are we supposed to see about the kingdom in the silence of this miracle? Well, I think to understand the silence, we need to first hear Jesus sigh. Jesus sighs deeply, and the question is why? Some people say what he's doing in sighing is he's doing that sign language. He's trying to show the man something. But the sign language of prayer was not the sigh. It was looking up to heaven. So that's not it. Other people say that the sigh of Jesus is showing his empathy. He's showing the man, I know you've suffered. You've cried out in the night and no one could hear your voice. And you've had so much loneliness as no one could speak to you. And now I'm showing you that I'm entering into your pain in my sigh. But I don't think that's the case either because the sigh happens right before the healing. At that point, your gesture should not be, if I was going to heal someone in the next second, I wouldn't be sighing. I'd be pumping my fist. Yes, Lord, come on, let's heal this man. And Jesus gives a deep sigh. I think that sigh wasn't for the man who was going to be healed. That sigh was for himself. And we see that in this text in a very unique way. There is a Greek word that describes this man's condition in verse 32. That the man was deaf and could hardly talk. Now that word for can hardly talk in Greek is the word mogilios. Now that word occurs only one other time in all of Scripture. And that's in the Greek translation of Isaiah 35. Which is the text about the Messiah. We read this. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened 
and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue, the Magulias, will shout for joy. What's going on in Mark 7 is Isaiah 35 being fulfilled. But Jesus sighs because he knows what comes the verse right before this healing. The Messiah's purpose in verse 4 is this. Strengthen feeble hands and steady knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save. And in this moment, Jesus is sighing because he knows he's come not to bring divine retribution, but to bear divine retribution. He is not sighing for the man. He is sighing for what he is going to take on. That in order to bring this healing, he must take on the pain himself. This miracle in Mark chapter 7 is the third and final of a series of miracles that is meant to describe who Jesus is. And this climax is in the next chapter when Peter finally realizes you are the Messiah. I got that from this text. You are the Messiah. I've seen that in the miracle. And after that, Jesus in 8 verse 31 describes what the Messiah will do. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, must be rejected by the elders, and must be killed. Jesus is sighing because he knows that the way he'll bring healing is through his own death. And he commands silence because until you see his cross, you will not understand his power. That the only way he is going to open the eyes of the blind is by shutting his own eyes in death. That the only way that he can open the mouth of the mute is by taking on the lips of himself to cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only way that he can heal the lame is by having his own limbs pinned to a cross. And that is why he sighs. So this shows us the third truth about the kingdom, that the kingdom of God comes only through the cross of Jesus. These three wrinkles in the text show us the kingdom of God embraces the world that the kingdom of God also is the, the sort of uh, thing that heals and that finally the kingdom of God comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. Now with those three truths of the kingdom that are shown in the miracles of Jesus' life, I want to leave with something for your mind and then something for your heart. First of all, something for your mind. This miracle enacted the kingdom of God. That's what the world belongs to God says. That's what miracles do. It proclaims in word and deed the coming of God's rule. But I want us to see tonight that the miracles of God do that, but so do the sacraments. That these sacraments that we celebrate, especially what we celebrated last week, the Lord's Supper, is this sign language of grace. This is enacting the kingdom of God because at the table of the Lord, we see that the kingdom of God truly does embrace the world. This is the table prepared for all nations. And we see that second truth of the kingdom. That the kingdom of God also meets us where we have needs. That at the table of the Lord, we are fed with bread and with juice. These tangible expressions like spit in the mouth where we can taste and see our Savior near us. And that thirdly, the kingdom of God points to the cross and comes through the cross. We proclaim the Lord's death until it comes again. That in the sacraments, we enter into the kingdom of God just as this man did when he was healed. We enter into a story so much bigger than our own. That's why when the people, when they see the miracle, they say he has done everything well, which echoes the beginning of time, Genesis 31, that God made everything very good and echoes the end of time, Revelation 21.5, he will make everything new. The sacraments draw us into this huge story of the kingdom. That's the truth for our mind. But now something for our hearts. If you want to know what the kingdom of God looks like, what it's manifest in the world, it is this deaf man who hears for the first time. And the first word he hears is Ephatha, be opened. Not just your ears and your mouth, but your heart to a God who loves you. Be opened. I want us to see a video clip of deaf people in our world who in the coming of God's kingdom, through the advances he's given in technology, are now hearing for the first time. And I want us to see this video and I want us to see in it the kingdom of God and its joy. And then I'll say one more thing. But first, let's see this and see in it the kingdom of God. Recording. Lachlan. First, first hearing aid. Are you ready? No. <laughs> okay. This is the, the big moment, moment here. Moment. 
I'm just gonna hear something. We don't really know what. I'm gonna roll this one. I'm gonna have to push on your head just a little bit. There you go. So now technically your device is on. <laughs> Can you tell? I know I look like an elderly munchkin, but do I sound like one now? <laughs> And so will the ears of the deaf be unstopped. This is the work of the Messiah, even today in the coming of his kingdom. And for our hearts, I want us to see that image of the kingdom. I want to close with this story. We began with Beethoven. Beethoven, who suffered so much, and in that letter where he talked about wanting to end his life, he concludes with a, a word about his creator. And he talks in, his, in, that, in that word about entrusting himself to his creator and at the end of his life, when he couldn't hear anything, he wrote the Ninth Symphony. He never heard a single note that he wrote. In fact, when he performed it for the first time, at the end of it, the crowd rose in thunderous applause, and one of the performers actually had to turn him around so he could see it because he couldn't even hear their applause. But at the end of that Ninth Symphony, he broke into the music of the Ode to Joy that he wrote. And at the end of his life, some scholars say that his final words were these words, that in heaven I will hear again. He never heard the sound of the ode to joy that he wrote, but I want us today as we finish this sermon to hear the sound of the kingdom and with Beethoven to look to the day when the kingdom of God will break into this world and all will be healed in Jesus Christ and he will hear the song that he wrote. Let's conclude with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, The Ode to Joy. Friends, that is the sound of the kingdom. That is the sound of the God who brings the joy through the cross of Christ, who meets us in our need and who embraces the world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, your word speaks to our mind, but also to our heart. And we thank you through the surprising dimensions of this simple story, the where of it outside the promised land, outside the people of God, the how of it, these strange gestures, including your son reaching his fingers, your divine hands into our ears and spitting and reaching into our mouths, showing us that you meet us in ways that we can feel and experience. And Father, even in the way that you in your silence and in your sighing 
point to the cross, for it is in the cross that truly we are healed. And so, Father, we pray that as we leave this place, we would go into this world with an awareness of your kingdom, but also with hearts hungry to see your healing break out in us and through us in this week. Father, we pray for these things in Jesus' name, and all of us say, Amen. Our song of response it speaks of the Savior we've just had a glimpse of. Jesus heard with deep compassion that stand to save. seated. Jesus and all the ways of his life showed in word and deed the coming rule of God. And that not, king who showed us that now is seated on the throne, and he is the one that we pray through. As we do that tonight, are there any prayer requests, items of praise, or petition to share before the throne as a family? Yeah, stand. So we're praying for your sister-in-law, Loretta, and the cancer is spreading through her body. So we do want to lift her up. And anything else? Yeah, Daryl. Okay, she was part of that family that died in the fire. So we're praying for George Fitch and his wife who lost a daughter. Some of you might have heard, was it five or six people in the family were killed in a house fire this week? And so we want to pray. For... Uh, I think a total of six. Six, yeah. Two boys and two boys. Yeah, four kids and their parents. And so we want to pray for those families. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? If not, let us bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we long to see Jesus. To see not only as we've sung, to see Jesus high and lifted out, exalted to the throne with a name that is above every name, the one to whom every knee will bow, but also to see Jesus coming to us as a Messiah with healing in his wings, reaching out to us in our points of pain and shame and alienation and loneliness, reaching into our ears, reaching into our mouths, reaching into our hearts and souls, 
to bring his healing. And Father, we know that this healing is not through the advances of medicine or the workings of magic, but it is through his cross. Father, that only through his death and resurrection did this Messiah bear the wrath that we deserved. And with that, united us to himself so that we now could receive the joy and the peace and the healing and the reconciliation that only he deserves. And Father, we thank you for our Savior. Father, we pray in a world that needs to see this Savior, that needs to experience his healing touch. Father, there's so many bodies and minds and relationships and nations are broken by violence and by injustice, oppression, by fear, by doubt, by disease and injury and war and famine. Lord, in so many ways, this creation groans and we groan too. And so we pray this week for you to give us signs of your kingdom, that the Messiah who walked in Jesus Christ now through the working of your spirit would also give us first fruits of this kingdom. Father, we do pray for your healing on Loretta, that you would hold her in your hand. Lord, we know that cancer is to you not insurmountable, but rather something that you can remove at your will. So Father, if it's your will, may you do so. And yet we pray too that you will reach into her heart and that if it is your will through this to sustain her and to call her home, that you also would be her good shepherd. Heavenly Father, we pray for the family of those who lost a son, a daughter, grandchildren in this house fire. We pray for George Fitch and his wife and others involved. We can't imagine the grief and the pain and the questions they bring before your throne today. And yet we pray that they also would experience a glimpse of Jesus, the Messiah, walking among them with healing in his wings. Gracious God, we continue to pray for Joyce Heinen. We ask that you would bring healing and guidance to her this week. We lay before you the names we've mentioned this morning, as well as those in this body who have needs that aren't mentioned in congregational prayer. Lord, you know us. You know our chronic pain. You know the burdens we bear. You know the cries we bring to you in the quiet of the night. We pray today that you would be near us, that your power would flow in us. Lord, we also pray that your power be made perfect in weakness, that even in the cries of our pain and our questions, that we would reflect your gift of faith to a world that needs to see Jesus in us. And Father, this would move us to compassion, that in this week we as a body would reach out to the lost and the hurting, that this would be a week of salvation and of healing and of new glimpses of your coming kingdom. So Father, receive our prayers. Receive also our gifts and our offerings tonight. May you use them in the work of justice for all, that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we offer these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our evening offering is for the ministry of justice for all. And, as we, uh, and we give those offerings as they do work in this community, but also around this nation.
That is our Messiah. That is our Savior. Friends, with a Messiah and a kingdom that embraces this world, that gathers the nations in, we stand and profess our faith with believers around the world through the, the summary of the faith of the Apostles' Creed. Would you stand and say those words with me? <coughs> Saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We believe in these things and we go into this world with hope because he not only went to the cross, but because he lives. Let's sing that song together, Because He Lives.
can face tomorrow and because he lives, we can serve him and watch his kingdom come tomorrow and all the days of our lives. And as you do that, go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen.